Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you all for joining. I'm going to be talking about uh, the need and opportunities for including fungi in biodiversity databases and conservation activities. I think going here. So, oh, move. There we go. So many of you, when you look at this, you just see the plants. But what I'm hoping is that I, is that you're also looking at some of the other wonderful organisms that are in um, in this scene. So on that bark and whatever else are wonderful lichenized fungi um, in the grass. Um, can't see them, but they're endophytic fungi in the leaves. And in the roots are vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizas that are essential for um, bringing in nutrients and water and providing a pathogen protection to the, to the grasses and the herbs. Um, there are decomposer fungi in there that are critically important for nutrient um, recycling, uh, building up the soil for new growth of other plants and everything else that depends on the soil. And on the roots of the trees, especially pines, uh, pinaceae and oaks and whatever else are ectomycorrhizas. Again, an obligate relationship for these trees, um, necessary for uh, bringing in nitrogen, micronutrients, phosphorus, uh, water, um, and so essential for the trees to survive. And also the trees are essential for the fungi to uh, continue their life cycle. And don't forget the orchids. Orchids um, require fungi for seed germination. And there's a growing body of data to show that many orchids require uh, fungi uh, in adult state for uh, nutrient absorption and other uh, processes. And even more exciting, or as exciting, there's more and more data showing that there can be um, transfer of carbon, nutrients, and other uh, compounds between plants mediated by fungal uh, common mycelial networks. In other words, these myce uh, a particular mycelium fungus can, um, can uh, connect more than one tree and transfer uh, these compounds between them. It's not just carbon, but here's two cases. One is um, with these aphids on tomato plant that it transfers um, defense signaling between plants. And it's also been shown in Douglas fir, where one tree that's being uh, defoliated will actually send defense uh, signaling to an adjacent tree that can then set up its defense mechanism to fend off uh, the uh, herbivores. So fungi are critically important in so many different aspects of ecology, which is why I think John Muir was thinking about fungi when he made this wonderful quote. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find a hitch to everything else in the universe. Just say we find a hitch to fungi. Um, um, and that's uh, really driving much of what's going on in our systems. So therefore, it's kind of you know disconcerting that we know that there are uh, fungi under threat. This paper was done in 1991 about uh, another mass extinction. Fungi haven't exactly got the PR that amphibians and other groups have had, but it's um, a growing understanding that, that fungi can be under threat. And that's not surprising because, you know, fungi face the same threats as animals and plants. Habitat loss, loss of symbiotic host, pollution, overexploitation, climate change. So it's not surprising that fungi some fungi can be threatened. And so determining which species are thriving and which are rare or declining, of course, is a crucial first step for targeting conservation action towards species in greatest need. We never have enough resources. We never have enough people. We never have enough time. So understanding what species are in need makes a lot of sense. Um, however, the conservation status of the vast majority of fungal species has not been assessed, either globally through the IUCN Red List are in the US and Canada through nature serve rankings. And when I'm talking about fungi, I mean macro fungi and lichenized fungi. Um, and so this greatly hinders as in, hindered inclusion of fungi in conservation discussions, access to funding, policy decisions, conservation actions, everything from you know, state DNRs, nature serves, state biodiversity heritage programs, and international activities. Um, it started in the U.S. pretty much in the Pacific Northwest with um, a Northwest Forest Plan, um, recognizing that fungi were a key component of the old growth forests. 
And so many, Anne showed this slide in the, uh, our roundtable discussion last week. Um, and so there are, you know, a reasonable number of fungi and lichens on, that you can find on Nature Server Explorer, Nature Server Explorer. But the vast majority of them have not really been given a rank. And so they're there, but they need to be further studied to be able to understand how threatened they may be. So um, assessing North American fungi, at least using ICUN criteria, has been a focus over the past several years. This is a group, uh, we had a workshop a couple of years ago in Carvallis. And so um, <clears throat> currently on the IUCN global list, there are nine, uh, from, from, I'm sorry, there's, a hundred and, there's 225 species in total. No, excuse me, 425 species in total on the global list. Of those, 148 are fungi from North America. So 99 basidiomycetes and 49 ascomycetes. Most of those are lichens. And there's another 200 species of North American fungi, macrofungi, uh, being uh, finalized. These were done uh, by NOAA, who will be talking uh, in a little bit. Uh, and we're just doing the reviews of those assessments. There's been some other um, progress. Uh, so for example, this book done by NOAA and colleagues on a field guide to rare fungi of California national forests. And NatureServe was instrumental in getting this done. So thank you very much. Um, so progress is being made. You know, that's great. And here's some of the fungi on the uh, global red list, but these are uh, endemic North American species. So here's some of the mushrooms. And you can see they're not, you know, little brown mushrooms. These are really bright, showy things. Um, some of them mycorrhizal, some of them decomposers. And here's some of the lichens that are on the, the global list. Again, some of our big showy um, lichens. So progress is being made, but remember that's uh, only about 1% of the estimated 15,000 species of macrofungi and lichens that are estimated to occur in the United States. So only 1% have been assessed. So we have a lot more work to be done. So why are we so far behind? Well, right, because to do any kind of assessment, you need information on the geographic distribution of the species, something on its population size, changes in the population size, is it stable, increasing, decreasing, some basic information on its biology, and hopefully some information on its threats and maybe even ideas to mitigate, because it's nice to get species on a threatened list, but if we don't know what the problem is or how to fix it, it's just a name on a list. So those data have been challenging, to say the least, to, to generate. Uh, but there are new opportunities that are allowing us to, to move forward, which is why we're starting to make some of these progress. Uh, one is that, you know, continued field work over the last 50 or more years. Um, and importantly, uh, studies of molecular data are providing the, some of the data that we need um, for making these assessments. Importantly, there's a growing recognition by the conservation community that they need to consider fungi in these discussions and policy decisions. And what I'll be talking about mostly is that these new computer-based tools and initiatives are generating information and engaging more people in the effort. So kind of traditionally making use of uh, historical collections, collections that are in uh, museums and university um, uh, fungaria, fungal collections, uh, we have the Michael portal now that came up five years ago or so. So you can actually go to one place and search all of the fungal collections in North America for these historical and traditional records. Uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility exists uh, with all the challenges and opportunities that you have with GBIF. But really where the big advancement is in engagement of amateur mycologists and other community scientists. Right, because fungal diversity and distributions are still so poorly documented, there's a great opportunity for discovery. There's a great opportunity for engagement. And it's important to engage the community because it's our best hope for documenting at scale what species are occurring where and when and how these patterns are changing. There's just over a thousand members, maybe 1100 something members in the Mycological Society of America. 
And the vast majority of those aren't doing fungal diversity studies. They're doing molecular biology, plant pathology, pathogen, pathology, whatever. But at the same time, there's over 10,000 members uh, associated with the North American Mycological Association, their affiliated clubs, and other amateur fungal associations in the US and Canada. So there's you know, a tenfold increase in number of bodies that we could hopefully engage. And so there's also a couple of um, initiatives that's been held uh, internationally that we can use as models for developing a program in the US and Canada. The first one was FungiMap, which was done in Australia, where the coordinators at um, Royal Botanic Garden Melbourne um, sent out a list of 100 species and asked the field naturalist, the amateur uh, naturalist, to document what they find, where they occurred, when they occurred. And it had a major impact on understanding the distribution of fungi in, Aust in Australia. And just to show you some of the impact of this, um, this is from Tom May's data. Um, if you look at the fungarium specimens, the uh, fungal collection specimens in a traditional uh, fungaria, the vast majority of species have one or two or just a couple of records because uh, these museum collections are diversity collections, right? Once you got it, you got it. So you can't really do much as far as understanding distribution patterns or understanding trends uh, when you only have one, two, or four specimens of a species. But if you look at what happened with the fungi um, map data, the vast majority of those species end up having lots and lots of records. And all of a sudden, when you have a thousand records, you can start making some statement about their distribution. And over time, potential changes in that distribution. Another project in the UK, coordinated by Royal Botanic Garden Q, is the Lost and Found Project, where they identify, they sent out a list of species that were either considered extremely rare or actually extirpated from the islands and asked um, community scientists, amateurs to go out and look for these. And what they found was that some of the really um, inconspicuous species, um, when they went out and searched for them, they found them. And so they maybe weren't as rare as we thought. But some of the conspicuous species, some of the big mushrooms, big uh, cup fungi, things like that, haven't been found again, which really documents with some rigorous data that these species are rare and threatened, or maybe even extirpated from the island. So using these kind of things, realize that there was an opportunity here in North America. And that then brings us to the Fungal Diversity Survey. And Fundus, is really providing the tools, incentives, and coordination to engage community scientists in generating data needed for conservation assessments, and importantly, to advocate for conservation action. And two of the projects accomplishing these goals are the Rare Challenges and the Fungal Diversity Database. So the Rare Challenges are just that. Uh, the first one was uh, 10 species that we asked uh, from the West Coast, ask people to uh, go out and find them. I'm not going to talk more about this because uh, Kristen's going to talk in detail about this next. But just to say that it's been a very successful project, uh, it will continue in the ensuing years, and that we're adding another uh, rare challenge in the Northeast, so stay tuned for uh, that. The other big project is the Fungal Diversity, um, diversity Database. And that is taking advantage of iNaturalist. We all know that iNaturalist is this amazing resource where anybody can post pictures on uh, get uh, help in identification. Uh, this is an older uh, snapshot that I took, but even at this time, there were over there were 3.5 million fungi globally, uh, with which blows my mind, 318,000 observers. Um, but we also know that the quality of observations and the amount of metadata on these uh, uh, postings really varies greatly. And that high quality observations are the basis for documenting diversity distributions in plant and habitat associations. So the Fundus Biodiversity, Fungal Biodiversity Data Project is really set up to encourage and facilitate high quality observations 
Um, the site provides instructions for taking quality photos and suggestions for the needed metadata to be included. And there's a team of triagers who provide quality controls. So the idea is that let's take this incredible platform of iNaturalist, but really up the quality of it so it is highly useful. So we have these two different um, programs right now, the Rare Challenges, the Biodiversity um, Database. How are we going to put those data to work? We can engage people to do this, but they want to see their data actually being used and implemented into conservation action. And to do that, we're so excited to be able to have this conversation here at the Biodiversity Without Borders Conference, because really we think our key partner that we could hopefully work with is NatureServe and uh, state natural heritage programs or biodiversity heritage programs, uh, as well as park and land managers. So, you know, really in these conversations, how do we get the data that that funders can generate? How do we get that to you so it can be put to work? Also using these data in IUCN red list assessments and for some of the engagement advocacy work working with uh, some of the developing uh, fungal NGO, conservation uh, NGOs to, to do that. And to increase the number of people we're working with, we're really looking to work more closely with the North American Mycological Association, which is the amateur uh, umbrella for a whole slew of amateur clubs throughout the country. And so establish and support these clubs conservation coordinators, um, really work with them to generate the data. So in conclusion, there are undoubtedly species of fungi need to be conserved and considered in management plans. Um, the evolutionary studies, the biologic, you know, the um, biologists are generating some of the data we need to be able to do this. But much of the data needed are observational. What occurs where and when and how these patterns are changing. And it's community mycologists working through things like fundus uh, and in collaboration with professionals, both professional mycologists and professionals in the conservation community like NatureServe biologist, uh, natural, uh, um, natural uh, plant, um, biodiversity heritage biologist, uh, park managers, whatever else that can um, work and use these data. So that's what I wanted to talk about. I don't know how much time we have, whether we can actually um, have time for questions or not, but yeah. Thank you so much, Greg. We're going to take one question. Um, Mike Shaffley already wrote it in, so we're going to take his. And it's uh, he writes, how much understanding is there of community fidelity of fungal species? Without species-specific assessment, we're counting on the coarse filter of community types to protect their diversity, as we do for all kinds of poorly known species. How well do you think they work? I'm going to yeah. stop there. Even though there's more, it's actually yeah. a second question. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. So we're, we're getting there. So some um, habitat types, we have an idea. But you know, for the most part, our knowledge of a lot of the fungal diversity patterns are so poor that it's, it's maybe a little premature to say that, hey, this is only restricted to this habitat or this habitat. We're getting that. We know a bunch of species that are dependent upon, say, old growth forests. Or in Europe, there's a whole slew of species that we know are on these uh, semi-natural grasslands. So we're getting there, but I think we're maybe premature to say we have the data for all these different habitats. And, but for those that work, it works. The one thing I do want to say, though, there are cases where management of those habitats might um, get tweaked to um, benefit fungi, not hurt the rest of the organisms, but just standard management practices may not be enough to um, maintain fungal diversity. Uh, example of uh, that is, uh, you know, increased leaving of uh, standing dead uh, wood or um, when there's thinning, leaving enough uh, mature trees to serve as nurse trees and things like that. So, yes, my answer is yes, but still developing.